All right, folks, I'm gonna get us started um, because I am not super confident that I'm going to be able to tell you every single thing I wanna tell you and still take questions. So um, welcome, thank you for being here. My name is Andrea Middleton. Um, I'll be talking to you today about the development of WordPress community programs, both how they got started, how they've evolved, and then bonus round, the challenges we still face. My hope is that if you're involved in a volunteer organized events program or interested in starting one, that you'll come away from this talk with a better understanding of how we do things in WordPress, um, both what has worked well and what hasn't worked well for us. Um, like I said, I'm going to be running through about seven years of the last um, of, of my professional career. Um, so it's uh, happy, happily, quite actually a lot of stuff. <laughs> Sometimes when you're doing community stuff, it feels like you're kind of on a treadmill, and working on this talk has been gratifying to see just like how far we've come in that period of time. Um, I'm going to describe the changes roughly according to date, because, um, but I'm going to section that out into the WordCamp program, since we got started with the WordCamp program first. Then I'm going to take us back in time and restart with the meetup program, and then we're gonna bring it all together with the stuff that we're still struggling with on both sides, WordCamps and meetups. So um, since the WordCamp program was born first, we're gonna get that started. Um, this was the first community support, or kind of community-centered program we had. Uh, WordCamps, just to give you a basic definition, are uh, casual locally organized conferences centered on WordPress that are entirely staffed from organizers to speakers to day of workers by volunteers. They also have very cheap tickets. We have a ticket price cap of $20 per person per day, and that's international. We have a, a special exchange rate that we use called the Big Mac Index. If you're interested in that, let me know, um, to translate that from a uh, cost of living perspective overseas. The first WordCamp was envisioned as a bar camp about WordPress, hence the name. Um, Matt Mullenweg, who's a co-founder of WordPress and was the first WordCamp organizer, was also one of the original group of people who organized the first bar camp back in 2005. And he organized his first WordCamp in 2006. This is a picture from that event. You'll see little baby Matt Mullenweg there on the... Uh, on the stage, talking to a lot of people who were just super stoked to get in a room and talk WordPress all day. And the event kind of grew in popularity from there. As you can see, uh, by 2010, we had 72 WordCamps that we knew of around the world. Um, when I say we and no, I'm being very unspecific because there was actually no program support of WordCamps at this point. Um, there was no oversight, and due to that lack of oversight and lack of support, there were quite a few challenges that our organizers faced. Um, some examples, we had organizers audited by the IRS for running a lot of revenue that was unrelated to their personal business and or their personal lives through their accounts. We had PayPal accounts getting frozen because of ridiculous amounts of ticket revenue running through an account that at previously had maybe received $100 a year. Uh, we had organ one time, or in the case of one event, um, organizers were brought up on charges for not meeting the legal requirements related to accessibility standards in the US. So actually were served with papers from the Attorney General. That was unpleasant. Um, in another case, an event popped up, got a lot of sponsors, and then disappeared and somebody ran off with that money. So as you can see, both, you know, we had issues both from the perspective of what, what made people think WordPress was all about, in the case of that very negative example at the end, malfeasance, um, and then also we had problems with the amount of risk that our community organizers were taking on. Um, and we didn't want anyone who was organizing an event for the WordPress Open Source Project to have personal ramifications, uh, at least not from a tax or legal perspective, certainly. So one of the first initiatives we had, and this came out in 2010, was to define the expectation for WordCamp. 
both for what a WordCamp was and then also who could organize one, okay? Also, not only organize, but to speak and sponsor, speak at or sponsor one. So we rolled out our first set of guidelines in 2010 with a blog post because, you know, that's WordPress. Um, I should pause here and say a lot of the programs that I'm going to be talking about um, from here on out are uh, were the brainchild and and the vision of a woman who at the time was named Jen we Jane Wells, currently known as Jen Milo. She's no longer with the WordPress community, and I worked very closely with her and executed her vision, but to not participate in erasure, I want to make it very clear that a lot of the structure we have today is due to her vision and her um, leadership. So, so this um, paragraph, <laughs> which you can't read, um, describes the basic expectation that anyone officially connected to a WordCamp both embrace the GPL and also respect the trademark. And that was one of the first guidelines we had for the, for the WordCamp program. And it continues to be, not as much anymore, but uh, it continues to be a subject of contention. Um, it's something that we feel very strongly about because the GPL is what makes WordPress possible. Um, but a lot of the WordPress ecosystem is based on people selling services related to themes and plugins. And so licensing is a really, really big deal in our community. Um, but this is our, official, our initial set of rules. It seems like a pretty short and simple list. Um, it is uh, predictably packed with lots of uh, secret issues <laughs> um, that you get into when you actually try to implement a short and simple list of rules. Um, for example, the trademark and license thing seems like it would be a no-brainer, but then it gets complicated. What does local mean? Um, suburbs versus city centers. I was born there, but I live somewhere else now, but that's where my heart is. Um, all of these things of like what, what gives you the, the sense of this is my place. Um, we argue about geography a lot in this program. Um, it has given me a lot more respect for geopolitics, I will tell you that. Um, so this was our starting point. And um, another new development right around this time is that if you wanted to organize a WordCamp, you had to send in an application. And then you would get permission to go ahead with that. And before we gave permission, we would ask you to agree to these, to these um, what we were calling at the time, guidelines. Just to give you a sense of like how this program has grown since, um, I was hired as the first full-time um, sponsored person to work on community programs in 2011. As you can see, when we started actually enforcing these guidelines, we had a big fall off in number of events that were kind of inside the program. And we very slowly kind of made our way past that benchmark and then beyond. We uh, continued to hire people. We hired one person in 2013, another in 2015. By the end of this year, the group of people who are paid to work on these programs full time will probably be 10, with seven of those being community organizers and three being developers. All of these people are paid by Automatic, which is the company behind WordPress.com, as um, to work full time as volunteers for WordPress, for the WordPress open source project, just to be really clear. In 2011, when I got started, we published an entire site called plan.wordcamp.org, aimed at giving people more specific guidelines and standards, and also just sharing collected wisdom from experienced WordCamp organizers. This was um, painful, because what we essentially did is we called everything a guideline, whether it was a hard rule or a deal breaker, or whether it was just a best practice. And so for the next like two or three years, we had active community discussions about what those deal breakers actually were and what were just the things we think people should do when they're organizing WordCamp, right? Um, it was a little bit turbulent, but we finally got there in the end. By 2014, we started shifting our language away from guidelines, which we agreed was vague, over to expectations and agreements. 
Um, and we, uh, we had always asked people to, uh, anyone who was a speaker, sponsor, organizer, or volunteer, to agree to all of these standards. They include licensing, and then they include like the values or the basic expectations of the WordCamp program. Um, I wanna run through the application process briefly. Um, because I know that um, this is new for <laughs> this community, certainly. So this is how we run people through um, an application process. If you want to organize a WordCamp in Narnia, you send in your application. Um, one of our community volunteers vets the application. It's fairly long. It asks you a lot of questions. Um, we look specifically for three main deal breakers. Is there a local user group? Is the person, and is that user group active? Is the person who is applying to organize the event active in that group? They don't have to be organizing it, they just have to be active in the community. And then finally, we go pretty deep on a Google search for that person and all of their stuffs, um, like five to eight pages deep, to see if we can find anything that would be a initial red flag for whether or not that person could successfully create a welcoming and inclusive space within our community. So we're really, we are careful about who we task with the very complicated and inflected job of creating a welcoming space in our community. And we're real intentional about that. It's impossible to judge every, someone's ability to do that exclusively through uh, um, vetting them, <laughs> but uh, it's our way to at least do our due diligence at the beginning. From So if all those questions are yes, then we move on to an orientation. This is um, an hour-long video hangout or Zoom call where we discuss all of our expectations, so our hard rules, our best practices, things kind of global, like ways we encourage people to approach the event design and the event organizing, building their team, what to watch out for, things that they definitely need to think about. Um, and then we give them some information about the support structure they can get from us, and I'll be talking about that support structure soon. We send them this agreement um, through HelloSign. They give it a little signature, that way it's all official. Um, that's not legally binding or anything, it just feels like it gets better engagement, like, okay, now I agree. Um, and then they move on to the pre-planning list. Just real briefly, after pre-planning, they hit, they go to look for a venue, because you need a venue to have a WordCamp. Um, once they have a venue and a preliminary budget, we have a second meeting, it's like two, another hour probably, to run through their budget line by line um, and make sure that everything that they want to spend money on matches expectations for WordCamp. This is where we get into the nitty gritty of what the event's really gonna look like, right? Um, and then also to make sure that their expectations are realistic. Um, they haven't locked themselves into raising $100,000 when they've never had an event before, for example, stuff like that. Once we all come to agreement about the budget, they're put on the official schedule. They make the call for speaker, sponsors, volunteers, all of the people. That, I mean, this is the work, right? <laughs> that last step, step is the work. Um, we you know, pay all the vendors, and then you have your word camp. Backing up um, to the pre-planning stage, I'd like to talk a little bit about the tools we provide for our organizers. So as soon as you hit pre-planning, we give you a website on wordcamp.org. We have a large multi-site install, um, and everybody's WordCamp website is hosted on wordcamp.org. We rolled this out in 2011. Uh, it was a little contentious, um, and still tends to be a little contentious because uh, the, we share user tables and hosting um, and a server with wordpress.org, so uh, we're super, super serious about security. Um, we limit the amount of custom code you can put on a WordCamp site. We limit it practically to zero. You can only edit the sites with CSS. There's no custom code, uh, JavaScript or PHP. Um, and that has been a slightly pain, it continues to be a pain point a little bit. We find a lot of our organizers really wanna like showcase the might and, and power of WordPress with this one event website. Um, but we find that not having to bike shed about the website forever and ever and ever does tend to move the organizing process along 
more expeditiously. Um, we also give people an official email address. This is currently just a forward. We don't provide mailboxes for anyone or anything. Um, this has been complicated and hard for us to figure out. We still haven't fixed it yet. Another thing we provide is a, a registration tool. We built our own. It's called Camp Ticks. It's on the WordPress repo if anybody wants to use it. It's not pretty, but it works. Um, that pretty much, that, that is the summary for all of our tools, uh, by the way. <laughs> They're not pretty. They mostly work. Um, we also put all of our tools on an SVN repository, including our base theme and all of our custom post types plugins so that uh, community organizers could contribute to making the tools better. Um, in uh, just to give you a overview of kind of what those tools look like, this is the back end of a WordCamp website. We have custom post types for speakers, sessions, sponsors, and organizers, which allows us to do some fun things as far as like automatically creating grid schedules on the front end. Um, it also allows us to do some automation of crediting community contributions on WordPress.org. Um, and to talk about that, I should back up just a little bit. In 2012, the WordPress Open Source Project created um, a, lar a lar num large number of community uh, contributor teams. And this is, I think, all of our icons <laughs> uh, connected to all of our community teams. These last four down here, marketing, command line interface, hosting, and to some, to some extent, testing um, kind of came on a couple of, or became active a couple of years ago. But we launched all of these teams and gave them all, of course, blogs to uh, collaborate on. Um, and then, and w all of the work that's done to support WordCamps and meetups are done through uh, that little bowling pin uh, icon, the community team. Um, we call it, we tend to call it the global community team um, to emphasize the fact that we are international to all of our people. It's a good reminder for everyone because one tends to make decisions or want to have decisions made based on your local context, but we're always making decisions as often as we can based on the global context. So, um, and just another weird word we like to use for our commit level volunteers on the contributor team, we have a term we use for those which are deputies. Um, these are not just our community organizers, like our meetup and WordCamp organizers are, are on our team, whether they like it or not. But then there are also people who um, support those organizers on a volunteer basis by processing applications, mentoring camps, helping resolve conflicts, and those we call deputies. So the, uh, the kind of sassy automation part that we have is that in 2014 we connected um, WordCamp.org with WordPress.org profiles. So here you see a contributor who is part of a lot of different teams. Love Mika, she's a rock star. Um, and she has, um, they're nestled between the plugin and the support team rep icon is our speaker icon because she's a, she was a speaker at a, at least one WordCamp, um, if not multiples. Um, here you see a community organizer's profile, and also you can see in the activity update that David joined the organizing team for WordCamp Orlando a few months ago. The activity stream is something we've been experimenting with. We actually have the capacity to post an update when someone registers to attend a WordCamp or even checks in at a WordCamp. Um, there are some privacy concerns there, so that's way on the back burner right now. We haven't quite figured it out, um, but so we could turn it on, but we haven't yet. So um, Here's another profile. Uh, you can see that Josefa is a contributor to WordPress TV as well. That's that little uh, video <coughs> camera icon. One of the ways that the community team supports WordPress TV is through our traveling camera kits program. In, uh, back in 2010, we had a lot of organizers and a lot of events renting camera equipment so that they could video record their site, their content, or even live stream it. And we looked at that and we're like, well, for like three camps renting equipment, we could just buy the equipment and then just share it, right? So we ended up in 2011, we bought four kits. Actually, we ended up with six kits by 2011. Um, and these kits uh, travel from camp to camp. They include a set of lavalier mics, um, video cameras, tripods, etc. 
and uh, they, we ship them around to any work camp that wants them. They can, if they want, hire professional video videography, but it tends to be expensive, and so redu keeping our budgets lean so our organizers don't have to work real hard for sponsorship is a high priority for us. Um, this year, as of this year, we have 10 camps in the, or sorry, 10 kits in the US, three in Europe and three in Canada, because Canada and US shipping is ridiculously difficult. <laughs> so we just have Canada can, uh, kits. Um, WordPress TV, in case you didn't know, uh, is the place where we archive all of our video content related to WordPress. Uh, you can submit videos to it. Um, and then this is where hopefully, ideally, in a perfect world, every WordCamp session and in an even more perfect world, every meetup session would be posted um, for anyone to be able to access and learn from. Currently, we have content in about 36 different languages, and we posted 1750, like 1750 videos at, related to 2017 content at the very least. Um, so kind of last year, although some of that may have been posted in 2018. Um, we do cross post to YouTube, but we also feel really strongly that owning our own content is important. So we use this definitely as an archiving tool. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, entity structure because the community team is our volunteer group, but we provide a legal and financial entity as a backer of all WordCamps that we can. And this started in 2011. Um, we had you know, all these problems with WordCamp organizers getting uh, into, well, not a lot of problems with legal trouble, <laughs> thankfully, but um, quite a lot of trouble with financial trouble. Um, and then we, and we had this nonprofit, the WordPress Foundation, just kind of sitting around, holding the trademark, not doing anything. So as opportunistic optimists, we were like, let's use that thing, that seems great. Um, and we started running all of the money for our community events through the WordPress Foundation. We rolled this out in 2011. We kind of slowly got all of our North American camps in by 2012. We launched support for European camps in kind of late 2012. We had most European camps in by 2013 or 2014. Um, there are things that I could tell anyone who's super interested in operations and tax law um, about the fact that we then spun up in, uh, about two years ago, spun up a B Corp as a subsidiary of the foundation to use for as our legal and fi financial entity instead. Happy to talk to anybody about that later, um, but uh, that's what we're using now. We're using a, a B Corp instead. Um, again, it's important to remember that no one who is um, overseeing any of this work works for either of these entities. Neither of these entities have any employees at all. They just exist to handle the money and the legal liability associated with our events. Okay? They also make it possible for us to do something that we call the Global Community Sponsorship Program. This is a program that provides a nest egg of sponsorships to every single WordCamp in the world. We launched it in 2013, and um, we've had consistently at least three to, to I think one year we hit nine um, global community sponsors every year since then. This is roughly how it works. Um, don't be blinded by the gorgeousness of my slides. Uh, <laughs> sponsor, so if a sponsor wants to sponsor all of the events in our program, but doesn't want to have to interact with, oh, I don't know, 128 different volunteer teams, um, they can instead give the money to our entity, to our B Corp, and then the global community team will distribute those funds on behalf of the sponsor. In the case, uh, we call it a global community grant. Um, in the case of events that are running the money through the B Corp, it uh, really is just uh, an entry on paper, like, okay, well, of that nest egg, you know, of that money, you get this much. Um, for uh, word camps that are happening in countries where it's difficult to move money to, from the US, like India, Brazil, a couple of other places, we'll just send them the money, and then they'll run the money locally 
for themselves, taking in the, the uh, ticket revenue and other sponsorships and paying their vendors directly. I'm going to talk about money in just a second, so if you're like, Ooh, I'll answer your questions. Um, we build these sponsors based on anticipated um, or projected attendance in our programs, but we distribute the money based on the need of the individual camp. So first-time events may get as much as 80% of their fundraising burden taken care of by this grant because first-time events have a really hard time raising money, right? You're not a proven quantity. You don't have sponsor contacts a lot of the time, so we want to get them off and running. And then slowly over time, as a camp continues to happen year after year, we'll start reducing the amount of their, of their grant as they create more sponsor relationships. The minimum that every camp gets is well, sometimes as low as 20%, but we try to hit at least 25% of their fundraising burden. So they get a grant and then they have global sponsors and then they have to credit those global sponsors just like sponsors. And then also they have to raise local money, okay? Since we're talking about money, let's talk about money. Um, so because we're running all of the money through our entity, um, this means we have to like pay bills and stuff. Um, and we handle all of this as of 2014 through the back end of the WordPress, uh, the WordCamp website. We have a suite of budget plugins where um, organizers and program administrators can, can track and communicate about how the money is moving around. Um, we used to handle this all by email. Never ever do that. It was awful. <laughs> People would just email in their, oh, okay, sorry. It's really painful. Be nice to those people. Uh, <laughs> what we do now <laughs> is um, say an organizer has a vendor that needs to get paid. They fill out this custom post type that is a vendor payment request. It is a lot of information. Um, but then they upload the um, invoice to the media library of WordPress, and they attach it to this post, and then they submit it. And then the bill payer, Liz, get excited, there is <laughs> <laughs> a network admin of every single vendor payment request that's been submitted en masse from all of the WordCamps in the world. And like I said, we're doing about 130 a year, so there's a lot happening at any given time. Then the um, operations people can review these applications, approve them, and then bulk download a CSV file of wire transfers or ACH and then upload that to our bank and it's slick. I mean, bank software is terrible, so it's not slick on their side, but it is, again, functional but ugly on our side. Um, in 2015, we added, uh, sorry, in 2016, we added a sponsor invoicing tool, so you can um, request that we, well, you have to if you're running the money through us, request that we send out an invoice to sponsors. It goes through our QuickBooks install, and then attrib attributing income um, once you have, once the sponsor has paid, we go through these requests every single day. We clear every queue every day for money, and we will mark the invoice paid, and then you as an organizer will get a little email, and it says, hey, this sponsor paid. You can put them on your site now. Have a great day. Um, same thing with reimbursement requests. We also reimburse out-of-pocket requests, and that's a separate bu budget plug-in just to keep it all straight. In 2016, we also launched our in-dashboard budget tool, which is a way for um, all of our organizers build and maintain their event budget in the back end of the website. And that makes it possible for all organizers who are on the site to see it, and everyone who's active, uh, super admin and the network to also see it. Um, this. I don't know, you can't probably see it very well, but once you fill out your prelim budget, you hit that little yellow button and request a review. This sends an email to us. We set up a budget meeting, and we go through it line by line. Once it's approved, then a separate tab is created for a working budget. So we always have that approved budget on a tab that's locked. So we can always go back and see what was actually approved. And then the organizers can keep kind of, you know, because you're tweaking your budget all the time, right, as time goes on. Um, and that's what we use to check to see if the vendor payment requests actually match what we agreed to pay in the first place. And uh, before that, we used 
like Google documents like crazy and it was really, really hard to find everything and then editing was a problem and all that stuff. So we're really excited about this tool <laughs> very much a lot. Um, that is the end of the WordCamp portion. I'm gonna run through the meetup portion briefly. So I'm gonna take you back in time to 2012 and uh, to when we started our meetup program. Now again, WordPress meetups or user groups had existed before we had an actual meetup program, just like with WordCamps. But the way we handled spinning up a set of standards was a little bit different. In um, 2012, we started up a pro account with meetup.com and slowly started inviting groups who wanted to join. By 2013, we announced that a group of community volunteers would be collaborating on a list of what we call good faith rules. This has been a great way, that term specifically, good faith rules, has been a great way to make open source people who typically hate rules, am I right? Um, putting good faith in front has kind of fixed the, the uh, dislike of the term rules at the end. So I'm very, very happy about, <laughs> about that terminology change. Um, we posted a, a set of proposed guidelines. Again, we were using proposed guidelines at the time. We discussed it all publicly, had all of our fights, we revised it slightly, and then we are adopted. As you can see, there's only five of them. Um, the main sticking points for groups to this day are numbers one and four. Number one um, just talks about how organizers need to act in the best interests of the community rather than working to promote themselves or benefit one particular, particular community or group or company. Um, and again, that sounds simple, but in implementation, it's a little bit complicated sometimes, finding those balance, that balance. Um, and then number four asks that, um, or requires that any trusted member of the group can organize an event series in the group. We're gonna get to that a little bit more in a few slides, so I'm gonna press pause on, on good faith rule number four and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this is how that meetup program grew over time. Um, guess which year we hired a full-time sponsored volunteer to work on meetups. If you guessed 2015, you are correct. Um, what we have consistently found is funded people to process applications makes a huge difference for any application-based um, entry point program. Um, the process for onboarding new meetup organizers is a little bit lighter than WordCamps. There's no budget meeting, luckily, because um, generally meetups aren't handling a lot of money, um, but it's in the beginning part, it's pretty much the same. There's an application. We do the exact same vetting um, as far as whether or not the person will have issues making a welcoming environment in the group. Um, and then we also do an orientation that talks about these rules. It's usually closer to a half an hour, but it depends. And then we do keep in touch with a monthly newsletter. Uh, we just broke 600 groups, like last week. So that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, bonus points, if you can guess what metric will probably be going out next, it's countries. I'm really excited about uh, breaking the 100 country uh, metric next. But um, the program's growing really well. An exciting thing that we'll be doing soon is celebrating the 15th anniversary of WordPress with celebrations all over the world um, and communicating with meetup groups about that. Um, and that is the core of the meetup program. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the issues we face with meetups as we talk about the issues we face throughout. So um, next we are going to talk about community level view challenges. Um, the first one I want to discuss is the issue of leadership succession or fixing entrenched leadership in a community. The problem that we frequently run into once a community is founded is that our organizers will get tired um, or have life changes or have some reason that they want to pass on leadership to other people in the community. Very rarely there, we also have problems with someone who's like, I founded this community and this is my community and nobody can come in here because it's me, 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 me. But um, generally if you give them time, they get tired too. But both of those are problems. <laughs> and the rare problem is a problem from the get-go, right? So um, 
But generally the problem is burnout or exhaustion or just, hey, I don't want to do this all by myself, right? Because community organizing is a lot of work. So we address this in meetups and word camps kind of from two angles. The good faith rule for meetups that any trusted or reliable member of the group can organize an event is our way of addressing it from um, an, an entry point perspective, right? What we are telling people who are joining our community with that rule is that anyone who joins the group who is trusted by the group, and that's the that's the elastic part, right? How do you establish what that path to leadership is within the community? How do you identify whether or not someone is trusted and reliable? But we encourage people to make it as open as humanly possible. But anyone can come in and organize an event series within the user group. And the way we encourage organizers to use this is as a... Um, as a response to complaints <laughs> frequently or as a way to get more programming in the user group that they don't personally find interesting or that would be difficult for them to do because of timing or time commitments. Um, so if everybody in the group really wants to have a Saturday morning meetup and you have your other thing on Saturday morning, you can get anybody else to organize a Saturday morning event series and then they can handle that, right? If you have someone come up to you, maybe you're a developer-based group currently or most of your people are developers and then you get a blogger coming in saying, oh, all I wanna do is talk about content management and blogging and stuff. And you're like, oh, that sounds like the most boring thing in the world, no thank you. Um, you can say, hey, blogger person who has ideas, you have an idea, you have a job, here you go you organize that event series because anyone in our group can be a leader. Everyone is a leader in this, in this event series or in this group and if there's a lack, you can fill it, right? Which is a very open source kind of approach, right? You scratch your own itch. Um, but it's sometimes because a lot of our organizers don't come to us with a strong open source foundation, um, that's part of our process of training with our organizers is teaching them how we crazy open sourcey people approach some of these problems, right? By expanding the pool of leadership, by, by sharing the authority. With WordCamps, we come at it from a different angle. In 2015, a group of volunteers, deputies at the time, although we hadn't, that was also the year that we created the deputy program, um, said, you know what we really need? We need term limits for lead organizers. And I said, you are crazy that it's never going to work and the internet will break. No, no, no. And they said, no, it's good, we should do it. And I'm like, all right, well, people need to argue at you then because <laughs> everyone will hate it. And it has been re remarkably successful. Remarkably few people hated it, I will say. Although we have a, a number of people who still hate it. It is, a, it is a painful thing because we stick to it pretty hard. If you organize a WordCamp for two years in a row and you can't find one other person to step up and be the lead organizer, even with you still on the, on the organizing team, you can't have a WordCamp the next year. Like, you just can't, you know? And this is painful. I mean, you're a founder and you put all this time and effort into this camp. And now just because of some stupid rule, because we're open sourcing people and we don't like those, um, then you're just gonna throw away all this hard work. But from the perspective of the program, if the work you're doing as a community organizer doesn't resu result in any possible people who are interested in taking leadership in your community, then the job isn't done. The job isn't organizing the event. The job is organizing the community with organizing the event as the tool to make that community happen. And that is, that communication is something that we're continually working on, right? Because we come to people who are like, I wanna make an event. And we're like, that's cool. What you have to make is a community. And they're like, but the event. And we're like, well, yeah, but you can't have that unless you have a community because then it's not a community event, right? Um, and so basically shifting our people from being event organizer mindset to community, or community organizer mindset is a consistent battle for us. 
Uh, as mentioned, we do a lot of training because none of our people are professional event organizers. Um, anytime we get professional event organizers in, it's always a big fight because we do things weird, right? We do things in an open sourcey way. Um, so in um, 2015, we launched a training site. This basically is just a series of quizzes for meetup organizers, deputies, and WordCamp organizers based off of our handbooks. All of our handbooks are public, so I encourage you to go check them out. Um, there are, regrettably, more than I think we need. <laughs> um, but you know, more documentation, that's a nice problem to have, right? Um, the ones that we have quizzes for are the deputy handbook, the, organizer, the meetup organizer, and then the WordCamp organizer handbook. Last year, we launched um, a training specifically for our commit level access volunteers, our deputies, that I'm particularly proud of because it has a module specifically on open source values and methods. And as I mentioned, a lot of our community organizers don't come to us from an open source background. We have a large contingent, huge contingent of entrepreneurs in the WordPress community. And we have people coming to us from a business mindset, which doesn't always uh, mesh well with some of the more kind of distributed authority, uh, distributed, uh, uh, open, transparent processes of an open source process. So this particular module talking about like both what open source is, the value, the values and methodology that we use in open source, and then how we apply those to community organizing um, is something I'm really excited about. Another thing we focus on is outreach. Um, getting people, attracting people from outside the WordPress bubble. I know this is an issue for a lot of communities, or open source communities, right? How do you get people who aren't actually in to come in? Um, we, in uh, 2017, our major feature launch on the community team was a dashboard widget, which made it into core, and now every single WordCamp, or sorry, WordPress website in the world that has been updated since 2017 um, has basically an ad for community events in the dashboard. It includes all of the meetups that are part of our chapter program, so that have been vetted and are you know part of our program, have agreed to the five good faith rules, and WordCamps. It um, the widget guesses the location of the user, but it can be, the location can be um, reset by clicking on that pencil icon. And so even if you're traveling with your WordPress website, you, if you show up in Belgrade, you can find out where the local user group is right there in your dashboard. And this has resulted in at least a 31% increase of attendance at our user groups. Um, it launched almost exactly a year ago, so we're still kind of judging how it's affected our WordCamp attendance. But this has been a really powerful way for us to let people know that they are part of the WordPress community, even if they didn't know there was one, and to get them to our spaces. We're also working on expanding WordPress community more from a top-down perspective of bringing WordCamps and WordPress community through intensive mentoring and what we're calling incubating um, through the incubator program. We launched this in 2016. It resulted in um, WordCamps in Harare, Denpasar, and Medellin. Um, it was an, at its base, it was an intensive mentoring program. We had people apply to get help with starting a local meetup group and then organizing a WordCamp as kind of a lightning rod event to bring people in and get them active in a community. Two of the three of these communities are still meeting and, has, and have had another WordCamp since, so that's a decent success rate for a pilot. We're gonna be running this event, uh, this uh, pro. Uh, initiative again this year with new communities. Um, another one of our focuses this year is promoting our diversity outreach speaker training. We have an amazing curriculum of uh, speaker training that is focused toward members of underrepresented groups in tech who may not think that they have a uh, anything worthwhile to talk about at our events. Um, Jill Binder here in the front is gonna be talking specifically about this program. She's leading our working group um, tomorrow at noon I, in I, what I believe is this room. 
Um, this program has been, this training has been proven to work and to change the number, the gender diversity at the very least, of the speaker rosters in multiple WordPress communities. So I am very excited about what we're doing with this. Um, the working group's job currently is just to promote this training to all of all 600 of our meetup groups and then to support any groups that want to run it and um, get more a more diverse list of speakers on their list. So what are we still struggling with? Lots of stuff. Um, as mentioned, smooth and peaceful leadership transitions are a challenge for us. Um, keeping our WordCamp volunteers active year round is something that we'd really like to do and we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, and then of course, developing our organizers, as you may have internalized, we have 600 meetup groups and only about 130 WordCamps last year, right? So, but we want to have 600 meetup groups, more than that, and 600 WordCamps, right? Every single meetup group should have a WordCamp. Um, our minimum viable product for WordCamp, by the way, is 50 people in a room all day talking WordPress. That's what we consider a WordCamp, right? Um, and practically any community can have that. It's just communicating to our organizers that they can indeed do something that uncomplicated. It doesn't have to be 14 tracks and 3,000 people. It can be something small and inclusive. Um, not that big is not inclusive, but it can be small and informal more precisely. Uh, keeping costs low is a problem for any event series, I think. Uh, feels like venues and food get more expensive every single darn year. Um, and this affects our program by taking time out of our organizer's schedule away from creating great content to raising money. Um, and we want our organizers not to have to spend more than about 20 hours for the entire project of the event planning process on fundraising, if we can, that's our goal. Um, logistics and operations, obviously moving money around <laughs> internationally is hard. Um, and then just kind of more broadly, like balancing that freedom of choice and independence um, with the values of the program itself, right? Um, giving people, making sure that people have a lot of freedom to iterate and innovate, but while still expressing the values of WordPress. Some upcoming projects we've got, we're probably gonna be having more country level events. We focus very closely on local events, but we're experimenting with kind of more big tent events. We have two flagship events, WordCamp US and WordCamp Europe, looking at maybe adding some flagship events to our schedule over the next five years. We would love to have a sassy personalized schedule picker like you have here at DrupalCon. Um, we're like this close to launching it someday soon. All WordCamps will have one. Um, I would love to have a budget snapshot tool that makes it easier for our organizers to know exactly how much money has come in, exactly how much has gone out, and where they may need to cut. Um, would love to provide more financial support to our meetup user groups um, if they need it. Uh, we definitely need to do more training for our organizers for how to handle code of conduct issues. Um, and as we continue to scale up, we may have to look at automating some of our training or even our budget review processes to just get a little bit less meeting-y and a little bit more streamlined with some of that stuff. But um, that's a lot of stuff. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions here or outside in the hall or any other time. And if you have a question, please come up to the mic so that we can include it in the archival thing of this. Okay, I had like a thousand questions, but right. I wanted to just go really up to the top. Uh-huh. Because uh, my head's exploding a little bit. This is great. And there's a lot of really great goodwill in the, in the Drupal community, but being able to, we're, we're doing it in a federated way mm -hmm. all around the world. There's a lot yeah. of people just doing it in their own pockets, mm -hmm. and we, we don't have an Andrea. Mm. So do you have any, just like from a high-level perspective, if, if you've done this for a while now, mm -hmm. and you've kind of gone from top down, and I know you've, you mm -hmm. know, the community has obviously helped, mm -hmm. so it's, it's both up that and place. down, mm -hmm. uh, and cross-sectionally too, but how would you recommend us proceeding, again, from a standpoint of probably hundreds or dozens of really willing people mm -hmm. to, you know, work with the DA, the Drupal Association, to maybe help us 
do a better job and we may not have the funding as a project to have an Andrea mm -hmm. there. I would like to be able to say that I thought not you didn't need a full-time sponsored volunteer to do this work, but I don't think you can do it with, uh, I, don't, I don't think you can run programs like this without having full-time sponsored volunteers on this, specifically because events themselves have deadlines and when you're handling money, you have to pay stuff on time and you have to process applications on time and if it weren't deadline-based for conferences, you could probably get away with it with meetups if you had enough really dedicated volunteers to do meetup support. But when you're supporting events that have deadlines <laughs> of paying bills and having an event at a certain time, you've got to have someone who has the time to do the mission critical stuff. Um, we, we really tried when we were onboarding the deputy, all of the people in our deputy program, we wanted to give them the mission critical jobs too, but um, we found that it, you, the, the comfort level of trusting a volunteer who's doing stuff as, as they can get to it with stuff like paying a venue is, it's just too much risk. Um, I mean, I have lots of thoughts of ways that the Drupal community could pivot um, with uh, <laughs> community program support. Um, I don't think the way we're doing it is necessarily the right way for everybody. It's the way that's working for us. Um, it was incredibly, incredibly painful to be the person who got a whole bunch of do-it-yourselfer founders of WordCamps that had been doing stuff without any rules at all for years. and held them to a set of rules that in that particular set of rules they did not have a say in. Um, that was a really, really hard two or three years of my life. So um, it's not work that I think people would be able to do long term without being paid. The emotional labor is through the roof. Um, doing it on a volunteer basis would be really hard. I also have many, many feelings about all of these, but I'll ask a simple question. Uh -huh. It's everything is, is amazing. Um, uh, with regard to the handbook documentation, mm -hmm. um, how much of that was generated by your team versus the community and how long a process was, was kind of working through that documentation? The documentation, so plan.wordcamp.org was written by one, by Jen Milo. Um, in a weekend because she is made of rainbows and magic. Um, but she had gone to like 50 word camps a year for a couple of years. So like she, and she's a UI genius also. So like she had um, all of these like user experience observations and had seen a broad cross section of what everyone was doing and talked to all of our organizers and knew exactly like, this works within our values, this doesn't work within our values, all that stuff, all the best practices stuff. The rulesy stuff um, was also pretty top down, like, um, but uh, the meetup documentation, I think we wrote too, right? That was sponsored volunteer work. Um, Josefa was the person we hired in 2015 to do the meetup <laughs> stuff, just to out Josefa. She's doing a great talk tomorrow on mid-market CMSs if you're interested. Um, but uh, yeah, our community continues to help support and maintain the documentation, and we do change the documentation periodically. Um, but that major task was done by sponsored people. Josefa is sharing that the current set of documents that we have weren't stable until we moved them on to the to make community. Right, for about a year after that. For about a year after that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was a good presentation. I Thanks. liked it. Okay. Um, uh, who handles the logistics of the AV equipment? You said you bought all that stuff. Uh, who stores it and where do you put it? 
That is a volunteer. Um, actually, we're on our second like main movie aroundy uh, volunteer uh, in the U.S. at least, um, who periodically has the kits shipped back to him and then checks all the equipment to make sure it's still working. Um, when we retire kits, we retire them to meetup groups so that, I mean, unless they're like broken, but when the stuff is a little old, um, we'll give it to a meetup group to use. Um, but yeah, we have uh, community volunteers and also we have a huge set of moderators for the WordPress TV team who uh, review all of the videos before they go on WordPress TV and uh, approve or don't approve them as per the, the standards for WordPress TV publication. Uh do you do you find that you have to use the uh, budgeting uh, as a hammer to make people comply to the rules? That's a good question. Or, or um, do people just generally go along with like a oh, like a where we work we have like a web standard everything has to look a certain way just like we did mm -hmm. with Drupal last year. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have to do you end up using that or do people just the two pla the place where we are most likely to have an argument with an organizer who has already been onboarded is definitely the budget meeting. Budget reviews are the last thing that our volunteers end up helping with um, because it's the hardest job because you have to be ready to tell people no. That's a place where we tell people no. Um, and you have to tell them why so that they'll keep working on the event. <laughs> So, um, but uh, no, uh, the budget, re we, there, there is a hammer aspect, uh, but you, we have deprecated most of our hammers through uh, better vetting and, and onboarding. Uh, <laughs> we try now to tell people all the unpalatable stuff that we're asking them to do up front. And if they don't like our unpalatable stuff, hopefully they will recuse themselves. Sometimes they lie and they say, yes, that unpalatable stuff is fine. I will definitely do that. And then they don't do it. Um, and that's when we have to have a series of conversations about like, no, but you can't do that anymore, or you have to do this thing. Um, and that's where the two-year rule also has an advantage, because we have a guaranteed succession no matter what, whether the person is good or not. Um, we don't eject organizers very often. I think we've uh, canceled events that were on the pre-planning schedule maybe three or four times, uh, probably at the budget meeting. Um, and then we have uh, asked like in the entire last seven years, only one person never to organize for us again. Mm. Well, just one more question. You, you mentioned 31% increase. Where do you collect that data? Uh, Meetup.com's API. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. So near the beginning, you talked about the application process workflow. Mm -hmm. Can you? Mm -hmm. It's somewhere, I know, I know things. I don't know when I need to stop talking. I think pretty soon, but yeah. yes. Okay. <clears throat> so um, do you have any kind of general numbers that you can say now, or is there a place where maybe we could find out later what the get total number is at like each point here? So it's like mm. 3,200, and then at the end it's like four or I was just, just a general kind of idea. <laughs> I don't know what our annual number of applications is off the top of my head. We don't have, I don't think we have it collected. We haven't collected it, but we could. We have a public uh, page where we show what applications have come in and what the response was. It's on uh, central.wordcamp.org. Um, and we, and it, that page also shows like how old the application is and what reason uh, what stage they're in in this process, and if they were rejected, it says rejected. So there is a place where you can go check. It's like, oh, I'm in Toulouse. Has anyone organ you know applied before? Oh, there's an application in process. I'll try to check in. So yeah, yeah, I like it too. Yes, last question. Uh, Kathy's question set me up about the application process. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't pass on the vetting mm -hmm. portion, is there training, do you go back to them with training on why they didn't get approved or how they can put them on a path to how they De can become a depends host? Depends on which of these bullet points is their failure point. Um, if they don't have a local meetup, then we 
say, we would love to have you be our organizer. First, you need to start a meetup because otherwise you can't have a community program because you don't have a community yet. And we funnel them into the meetup application process. Okay. If they're not active in the meetup and there is one, then we say, hey, get active in the meetup and then come back to us. Mm -hmm. If there is a red flag for being able to create a welcoming event, that's taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes we approach them and we're like, mm, this, this is not something that you could do as an organizer. And just generally, if we are going to require that you have this kind, create this kind of environment, is that something that's going to be hard for you to do? Um, and talk to people about whether some, how something could be problematic from a welcoming and inclusion perspective. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we just get back to them and we're like, we don't think that you're a good fit for our program. Right. So it really depends. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right, folks, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm happy to talk outside or any other time. I'll be in the open web lounge when I'm not in sessions. I will be in sessions practically all day today. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Y'all, y'all should give feedback on the talk through the um, DrupalCon session oh, yes. page. I love that tool so much. I want one of those. Thank you for coming. We'll you can have all of my stuff. All of our stuff is open source and available. If you go to make.wordpress.org/community, you can find all of it. If you can't find it, I'm on the Drupal Slack and also the Camp Organizers Slack under Andrea Middleton, or you can tweet me. Um, happy to share all of our resources and tell you all of my thoughts. So. Thank you for including me. My welcome here has been. So open armsy, it's been delightful. That was just the best. Oh, thank you. Like, so crammed full of information and presented yeah. so expertly. This is where we need USB. We're some kind of ports USB. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the, uh, the session selection team. Oh, actually, so that's the reason why I'm on the session. Yeah.